I want you to open up your, your Bibles, if you have them, to the book of John chapter 12. It'll be here on the screens. And, and I, I'm going to read this verse. Uh, this is the only verse we're going to read today. And today we're talking about Palm Sunday, what it means and, uh, and everything that it means for yourself. So I'm going to read it. You can follow along. This is what the Bible says. Um, the next day, the news that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem swept through the massive crowd gathering for the feast. So they took palm branches and went out to meet Jesus. Everyone was shouting, Lord, be our Savior. Blessed is the one who comes to us, sent from Yahweh, the King of Israel. And then Jesus found a young donkey and rode on it to fulfill what was prophesied. People of Zion, have no fear. Look, it's your king coming to you, riding on a young donkey. Now Jesus' disciples were confused and didn't fully understand the importance of what was taking place. But after he was raised and exalted into glory, they understood how Jesus fulfilled all the prophecies in the scriptures that were written about him. All the eyewitnesses of the miracle Jesus performed when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead kept spreading the news about Jesus to everyone. The news of his miracle of resurrection caused the crowds to swell as great numbers of people welcomed him into the city with joy. But to the Pharisees, they were disturbed by this and said to each other, we won't be able to stop this. The whole world is going to run after him. We have, a, we have a great picture here, and I want you to use your holy imagination today for you to picture a, a crowd of thousands of people waving palm branches, shouting for Jesus, wel welcoming him as the king, and the religious people weren't very happy about it. And then we have Jesus riding on a donkey. Like, what does all this mean? It means a lot. But today, let me give you my title for this message. It's simply this. It's better than you think. It's better than you think. Go ahead and close your eyes one more time. Holy Spirit, we thank you for this scripture, for the honor we get and the freedom we have to open up the word and, and get to learn more about who you are. Lord, at this moment, we pray for the person to our left and to our right. May you continue to bless them and keep them, Lord. You know the desires of their heart, Lord. So we lift them up to you. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, for making them so good looking. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. And everybody says, amen. Come on, make some noise right now because God is good. And someone just said you're good looking. Hey, God answers prayers. Come on, come on, come on. Well, uh, uh, this, this whole verse right here is, is, is so important because um, it is the triumphant entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. Today, um, and there's someone knocking on the door. You can let him in. And um, it's like our house, right? You see someone knocking. It's like, the door's open. <laughs> Anyways, the door is open, people. That'll preach. Anyways. Um, um, what was I talking about? Palm Sunday. Yeah, palms are good. Um, the thing about Palm Sunday that is so important is that this is the beginning of Holy Week. Today, we begin Jesus coming into Jerusalem, and next Sunday, Easter Sunday, is Resurrection Sunday. So, like Crystal said and Enoch said, we want to invite you to come, bring your friends and family. If they've never been to church before, if they've never heard a preaching, if they've never opened up a Bible, trust me, we respect that and value that. This isn't a social club for Christians, okay? We're not called to be salt to the already salted. That's how Christians turn salty, Okay. Um, we're not called to be the light where there is light. We want to um, uh, share the love and the gospel and the good news of Jesus with people that have never heard it before. So if you were concerned, bring him on. Um, and it's going to be a great time. Um, with that being said, um, have you ever um, had a friend talk to you um, about someone that you've never met before? And just by taking him to their word, you've already made up in your mind whether you like him or not. Does this happen to you all the time? I have opinionated friends. That's just, this is what I do. They're right here. Enoch's right here. And, and, and what happens, I don't know if this happens in your uh, relationship dynamics, that um, uh, they'll tell you about someone, right? Let's say you're going to meet someone from church. Oh, my God, I'm going to meet with so-and-so. And they're like, oh, my God, have you heard about her? And it's like, I have, like, no FOMO in my life. If you don't know what FOMO is, it's fear of missing out. Like, that doesn't exist in me. That's, like, my superpower. Maybe because I don't have the energy to care. Like, I have two daughters under the age of seven, so it's like, do you, boo-boo. You know what I'm saying? Like, whatever, like, have you heard? No, I don't care. You know what I'm saying? 
Like, there's, there's, a, there's cookies in my car right now. That's what I'm thinking about. Like, who cares about their drama? There's dirt right now on the TV. Like, what's going on? And uh, they, you know, people always want to tell you about people. But what, I, what I've come to realize is that people cannot be explained. They got to be experienced. Because there are people that your friends love that you're not going to vibe with. And there are people that your friends don't like, they're actually going to be such a blessing for your life. I mean, when Crystal and I were dating, a lot of people were like, bro, you don't want to, you don't want to go there. Imagine I would have listened to the haters, okay? You know what I'm saying? Like, where would Crystal be right now without me, right? <laughs> Just kidding, babe. Guys, we're here to enjoy church, not endure it. A lot of people try to talk you out of something, but just because they're not called to it doesn't mean that you're not called to it. How many times have we made up our mind about people that we don't even know and we close the doors when actually they carry a great blessing from God into our life? Because when God wants to bless you, he will do it through the people closest to you. I can't help but to think how many times... We have made up our minds about Jesus when we don't actually know who he is. How many times we've said, I trust Jesus. I don't trust Jesus. I love Jesus. Where is Jesus? I want to be with Jesus. When in reality, we don't really know who Jesus is. I was, I was, I'm doing a funeral next week for, for, for a friend, and, and, and they were not Christians. So they were filling me in on um, hey, this is, a, this is a funeral for people who don't know Jesus, but we want you to sneak Jesus in without them knowing. So can you like preach Jesus without saying Jesus? I'm like, I got you. I love it. There are people there who have never heard about Jesus, don't love Jesus. But there are people who are not Christians who respect Jesus. Can I say there's people in the church who trust Jesus and who don't trust Jesus. There are people here today who say we love Jesus, but in reality, we don't love the Jesus who really is. We love the Jesus that we've made up in our own minds. Do we really love Jesus or do we love the Jesus that we've read about, we see the posts of, the videos of? Is our relationship with Jesus based on what the number one vlogger says or what the celebrity preacher says or what the haters say? Or do I know Jesus for who he really is? Now, what we have to understand is that there is a real Jesus. Not the Jesus that people say. There is a real Jesus. Um, and, and, and Jesus is... The one historical character that we are okay with changing who he is. Now, there's, you know, we all went to school. Some of us didn't really pay much attention. And it shows, okay, stay in school. Um, whether you agree with historical characters or not, we take them at face value. Whether you agree or disagree with certain people, um, when you hear Martin Luther King, you just take him for who he is. Gandhi, Buddha, Mother Teresa. JFK, you take them for who they are, but Jesus is the one personality that we like to rewrite so that he fits the narrative of our lives. Why? Because we want Jesus to fit our description, our comfort in our lifestyle. You see, we want all the good things that he carries without him challenging all the bad things that we carry. And we want to rewrite Jesus for, for who he is, but there is a real Jesus. If you've never been to a church context, let me explain to you. We believe that Jesus is God in human form. We believe that he is the all-powerful creator of the universe who came and decided and chose out of love to wrap himself in human form and walked on earth. He was born from a virgin. He lived life the same way you and I lived our lives. He was tempted. The way we were tempted, he was challenged the way you and I were challenged and ended up choosing to give his life by hanging on a tree and taking on the sins of humanity, past, present, and future. That is who we believe the real Jesus is. Now, you can accept the real Jesus or reject the real Jesus. Can I tell you, I would respect you more if you reject the real Jesus than if you keep living with the fake version of Jesus. Let me say this again. Uh, I would respect you more if you made a decision about who the real Jesus is. You know what I believe? I believe that Jesus is the hope for humanity. 
I believe that Jesus is real. I believe that Jesus is here among us, within us, and around us. That's who Jesus is. And you have a decision, and you have all the power. It's in your hands to accept him or to reject him. But my friend, before you accept Jesus or reject Jesus, I want you to first understand Jesus. It is up to you. Nobody really understood Jesus. The people who followed Jesus didn't understand Jesus. I, I, I love that it says this, his disciples were always perplexed by Jesus. Now, Palm Sunday, let me paint you a picture. There's thousands of people gathered, and they're waiting for Jesus. And they're like, oh, my God, Hosanna. That means save us. Save us, Lord. And they're, woming, they're, they're waving palm branches. Now, in the, in the cultural text, what this means is that people would wave palm branches to receive dignitaries, political figures, conquerors, and kings because they wanted a king to come and rescue them. So all these people are saying, welcome king, come and save us. And they were praising the right guy, but not because of who he actually is, but they were praising a Jesus based on who they thought he was. They were bringing the right praise, but for all the wrong reasons. They were saying, Jesus, save us. They were welcoming a king. Can I tell you, Jesus didn't come to just be the king of Israel. Jesus didn't show up just to be a conqueror. Jesus didn't just show up to be a public and political figure. But, but, but let's be honest, the people of Israel, the Jews, if you read the story of the Bible, these people had some needs. They were getting conquered left and right. Like these people were like weak. Every time you read about the people of God, they were slaves somewhere. If y'all seen the Prince of Egypt, that's them. If you haven't seen it, it's like one of the few Christian movies that I promote. It's really good. Mariah Carey sings in it, Whitney Houston. Ooh, it's great. Not sponsored. <laughs> Um, the Israelites were always conquered by the Egyptians, by the Babylonians. At this point, they were conquered by the Romans. They had needs. They were excited that Jesus was showing up because they have needs. Now, let me ask you this question. Why are you here today? Why do we search for Jesus every Sunday? Do we search for Jesus because we want to know him or simply because we have need of him? Why are you here? Are you here because your marriage could use some Jesus? Do we search for Jesus because we've heard that that's the only way that we can actually be successful in business? Are you searching for Jesus because uh, you're in a financial hole right now and you, and you heard that song called Jaira and you're like, oh, that's good. I think Jaira means money, right? I heard Jaira. I want some of that Jaira. Are we looking for Jesus for the right reason? You could be praising the right God, but for all the wrong reasons. Can I tell you, uh, we don't search for Jesus because we have need of him. The reality is that our souls are always searching for Jesus because there is a hole that can only be filled when we get to know Jesus. Can I tell you, my hope in my heart as a pastor of this church is that you will develop a desire to know him. That every day you wake up and you're like, I just want to know Jesus. I don't understand Jesus, but I want to know Jesus. This is what I love about knowing Jesus. The more you know, the more you realize that you know nothing. The more you know Jesus, the more you realize you need nothing else. The more you know Jesus, you realize that he doesn't heal people. He is healing. He doesn't provide for people. He is the provision. You realize that the more you become uh, acquainted with the presence of God, there is nothing that can shake you because you feel safe. That's Jesus. These people were shouting him out, trying to welcome a Jesus, but they didn't understand him. But don't, don't worry about it. The fans didn't understand who Jesus was. But his followers didn't either. The story tells us that Jesus showed up, shows up in a donkey and the disciples were like, there goes Jesus again. <laughs> like, I can picture, like, the disciples are like, they're probably asking him, like, yo, uh, yo, Peter, John, like, why is Jesus riding on a donkey? And they're like, I, I don't know, man. Like, beats me. This guy does the weirdest things all the time. <laughs> they're serving water, and he's like, wine, go. It's like, wait, what? Like, like, he missed the Uber, he walked on water. Like, what's, like, Jesus, Jesus does weird things all the time. The disciples were, if you are in a space right now where you are feeling a little afflicted because you don't really understand why we're here every Sunday, trust me, you're in good company, neither did the disciples. Because that's the whole thing, right, about faith. The moment you understand that it's no longer faith, longer is 
not required for you to just believe and it's no longer Jesus. So the disciples were a little concerned because Jesus says, oh my God, we made it. Somebody go grab me a donkey. Like, for real, bro? Now, this is, this is why they were confused because Jesus was a pretty big deal. Jesus, the Bible says that the crowds were following him. There was thousands of people there to check him out. But let me tell you why they were there to check him out. You know, Jesus just came into Jerusalem. But you know what? When he was the day before, you know what he, Jesus was doing before he came in? He was raising a, a guy from the dead. That's what Jesus was doing. Before he came to the party, he raised his homie up from the dead. That's a pretty big deal. Now, let me, if, if you've never heard the story, Jesus had a friend named Lazarus. They called Jesus and said, hey, yo, your friend is dying. Now, they wanted him to rush, but, but, but long story short, Lazarus died. And, and Jesus raised him from the dead on the fourth day. Let me explain why that in Jewish culture, when somebody would die, they wouldn't touch the body for three days. Because they believed maybe the spirit will bring him back to life. Maybe something will happen and, 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 and you know, maybe he's in a coma. Maybe he's just really hurt. Maybe he stopped breathing. So they waited three days for there to be a natural reason why a person would come back to life. So Jesus waited till the fourth day so they would know ain't nothing natural about this. It's all supernatural. It's not like your, your expectations. It's not a spirit. It is me who brings it from the dead. So Jesus shows up and he says, um, Lazarus, get up. A dead man gets up. And everybody's like, whoa. That's a big deal. Now, that is why people are following him. Because they had to see it, and now they believe it once they saw it. They're not there because they trust him. They literally saw Jesus raise his friend from the dead. Now, that's a very significant moment. That changes you. Whether you have faith or not, that changes you. Now, I want you to, you're probably like, got it, that's in the Bible. I want you to think of whatever historical moment would have meant something for you. I would have loved to go back and see Martin Luther King Jr. say with his mouth, I have a dream. That would change me. Going back in time and seeing the Beatles perform, that would change me. Like there are certain moments that change you. Seeing someone raise someone from the dead, that will change you. Maybe you won't believe that Jesus is the king of kings, but you will realize Jesus is not who you think he is. There are some things that we experience that we're like, I don't really know who he is, but I know that he's not just another name. Because they saw it. They experienced it. That's why they wanted him to ride in on an elephant or something. Because this guy was a big deal, but Jesus comes here and... Rides in on a donkey. Can you imagine? Look, I, I, I like to think about this. What, what would I do if I raised somebody from the dead? Hmm. What would I do? You know, I, I would immediately come up with an online course, how to raise people from the dead. That's what we do nowadays. Today's day and age, social media era. We want to use everything as a platform. We want everyone to see how good we are at what we do. Or you love people, or let me do it so that everyone can see how much I love people. Or you brought a meal to a homeless. Let me post it because I, if I don't post it, it didn't happen. We like to capitalize on everything. We like to build platforms, public platforms out of things that are supposed to happen privately. We want everyone to know because it's not enough for us to know that God saw it. We need you to see it too. So we live public lives. But Jesus is like... Now, nah, I'm going to ride it on the donkey. You know, I, I would have I been Prince Ali from, from Aladdin. <laughs> Palm Sunday would have been like, Prince Ali, like, what's up, homies? Bow down. Do you know what I'm saying? That's me. Thank God I'm not God. <laughs> what would you do? Jesus says, uh, we're not doing all of that. We're going to ride in on a donkey. That perplexed everybody. That's what was so confusing. Like, you're a celebrity. You're a big deal. You just raised the guy from the dead. We have thousands of people here waiting for you. And you choose to be humble? Can I tell you, us Christians, we don't like humble leaders. We don't like Jesus to be humble. We don't like our pastors to be humble. We don't like our political figures to be humble. Because if God, the creator of the universe... Chooses to be humble. What does that say about how you and I should live our lives? What would, it, what would it mean if the leading voice that speaks for Christ and God chooses humility? What would that mean about the way that you dress on Sundays? 
What would that say about the things you post on social media? We don't like a humble God because that means that he wants humble children. We like regal God. We like the regal preacher. We like the regal political figure. We like the big deal because, because at least they're the lid. And if they're at 1,000 feet, at least I can get to 900. But God says, no, 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 no. The greatest of you will be the servant of all. And he comes down and he puts himself on a donkey. What are you riding today? What platform are you building for yourself? What type of name are you trying to build? What elephant have you been trying to climb when Jesus says, just get yourself off of that? Isn't that the best picture of what we call the gospel, the good news? A God who chooses humility. Now, if God was all about power and all about might and all about presentation, this would have been the best time for him to show off. This would have been the time to put on his priestly robes and to show up and be like, kiss the ring, homies. Like, I, I'm here. God's here. The, one, the Messiah is here. Like, cha-ching. Like, if God was all about the money and the show and the presentation, this would have been the perfect moment. But God shows us meekness. We love the name Meek Mill. We love the title Meek. We don't even know what Meek is, but we want to be Meek. You know what Meek means? Power under control. Doesn't mean I can't. It just means I choose not to. Power under control. Can I tell you the most powerful person in the room is never the loudest person in the room. The most powerful person in the room is not the one you think it's, it's always better than you think. You see, here's the thing about us humans. We get a little bit of power and we get drunk on it. We get a little bit of power and we abuse it. We end up hurting ourselves because we are not equipped to be powerful. Every time you get a praise, you can either choose whether, whether, whether this feed my elephant or would this feed my donkey. Can I tell you, whatever doesn't turn into praise will turn into pride. Whatever comes into your life that makes you think, I'm pretty good at this. <laughs> no, 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 I'm not, I'm not talking about being beat up human. I'm not talking about fake humility. No, you are great. You are equipped. But can I tell you, you were always designed to be great. You're not great because all of a sudden they see it. I don't care if nobody sees it. I want you to see it. I don't care if nobody ever praises you for it. I want you to know it. I am Highly favored. I am the head and not the tail. I am above and not beneath. I am not where I want to be, but thank God I'm not where I deserve to be. Jesus shows up and he's like, nah, we ain't doing all of that. We're going to stay down here. His disciples, his, his, his fans, they didn't understand Jesus. But neither did the church. You see, sometimes we think that, that the church understands who Jesus is. And we can talk about him. But there's no way to experience, to, to explain God. You only got to experience God. If you ever come across a leader that can tell you everything about God, that person lying. Because my God cannot be explained or understood. My God cannot be put into three points and say, this is what, be careful of the leader that tells you this is what God wants to do with your life. Be careful when the leader tells you, I feel, this is, no, 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 how do you? Hold up, get off the elephant, and get on the donkey. Can I tell you in this church, I never preach from something I know. I'm preaching from something that I'm reading, all of us together. I don't preach from things that I'm graduated from. I'm preaching from things that I'm going through. Because this is the thing about us as children. Can I tell you, I have daughters. One of them's right here on Roblox right now. <laughs> Christian Roblox only, okay? Can I tell you, uh, as her father, I'm, I'm not going to change much at this point. I am who I am. But every season of her life, as she grows and matures, God will reveal to her a new version of her father. See, because when she was little, I was just the caretaker. As she began to grow up, I'm her playmate. Now I'm her Roblox buddy. Later on, I'll be her confidant and her friend and her father and her advisor. But it's not because God changed, it's because I'm growing and maturing. Can I tell you, you will never fully experience the fullness of God until you are in front of him. 
So every single day we walk in a humility. Everybody say humility. That seems a cuss word in the church at this point. Because we want to teach you how to be great. Can I tell you, I cannot teach you how to be great because you're already born great. People ask me, how do you raise great leaders? I don't make Abraham to be great. He was already born great. We just got to allow him to be great. Can I tell you, you just got to allow yourself to be great. Stop searching for your potential out there. Can I tell you, your power is in here. You are a work of art, but you're not a painting that needs to be added. You're a sculpture that needs to be chiseled because greatness is already within you. And the religious leaders didn't understand Jesus. They were concerned. They were stressed out. They saw Jesus and they said, well, that's it. How are we going to stop this guy now? The, this, this, this is what they said. The whole world is running after him now. Wouldn't that be awesome if the whole world was running after Jesus? Oh, my God, the whole world is running after him now. How are we going to stop him? I wish even the church was running after Jesus. I wish us as parents were running after Jesus. I wish us as individuals we were running after Jesus. Can I tell you, when you actually run after Jesus, oh, my God, life gets better. The colors seem brighter. There's more harmony in the home. The food tastes better. Sex is better. If your kids are here, hey, we have a kids ministry. Get them in there. When you, when you, when you, when you really get to know God, everything gets better. But they're like, they're all running after Jesus. They weren't running after Jesus. The religious people were stressed out. They thought that Jesus was going to come and destroy their world. And can I tell you, they were right. Jesus always comes to destroy the world of the religious. It's funny. The more altars we build, the more he has to come and do some deconstruction. The more idols we build, the more work we give him to come and tear them down. God, why are you not allowing this thing to take off? Because it's not in my will. You know, this is what I, I, I love about Christians. We always have this word. We always have this question. Maybe you've asked it in your mind, in your spirit with different words. But we always ask this, God, I want to know God's will for my life. Putting ourselves at the center yet again. We put God in the mix, but like we put him around us. We want to know God's will for me. Can I tell you, the key is not to know God's will for your life. I just want to know God's will. I don't want to know what he wants me to build. I just want to know what he's building. I just want to know what he's up to. I just want to know what he's thinking. And can I tell you, at the center of it all, he's thinking about you. You're over here concerned like, where are the multitudes you want me to lead? He says, first I want you to lead yourself. God, where are all the thousands of people that I'm going to heal? And he says, why are you still all stressed out and have a headache though? Can I tell you, God loves every single one like we're the only one. When God looks down at us, and I know I say down like he's the guy with the beard up there in heaven looking down at us. But can I tell you, God is here. And he is looking at you. Not only is he looking at you, he's looking for you. He's asking the same question he asked, the first question ever recorded in the first conversation. In the first man, he says, where are you? Where are you right now? I know you're here, but are you here or are you at brunch already? Like, are, are, are you here right now? I love it. There's a great story when, when, when Moses is asked to go and receive the tablets. The Bible says that God tells Moses, I want you to go to the top of the mountain. And when you're on top of the mountain, it says, I want you to be on top of the mountain. It seems redundant. Basically said, I want you to go to church. And when you're at church, I want you to be at church. I'm like, yeah, I know that. No, no, no. Because sometimes we're here physically, but our spirits are somewhere else. Sometimes we're here with our spouse and we're a significant other, but our hearts are with um, the soul tie. Sometimes we're here and the bank account says something, but our spirit of lack says something else. Sometimes our mouth says we're here with a God who all things are possible, but our spirit is in a place called doubt. Can I tell you, be here. Be here right now. Jesus is here. The haters were saying, oh, Jesus is going to mess it up. Can I tell you, some of you need Jesus to come and mess up your world. Because he loves you too much to allow you to keep building this fake life that you've been building. That's just love. That's just love. 
God, may, may, may you come into local church and continue to destroy what doesn't give you glory. May you continue to come into our lives and continue to break down the idols. This is my prayer for you, that God messes you up, like in the best way possible. I'll never forget when I broke my arm, and the doctor's like, let me see it, and he just snaps it. Ah. Some of you are just so broken, you need to be snapped back into health. It is what it is. They said um, Jesus is going to come and, and destroy this world. I, I pray that God destroys whatever is not healthy and is not aligned with him. That's what he does. There's this picture of Jesus carrying a sheep, and, and I can't help but to shake it right now, so i got to talk about it. You've all seen that picture of, I call him Sexy Jesus. You all seen Sexy Jesus? Sometimes they paint him with like blonde hair, blue eyes, and a beard, and he has abs, you know what I'm saying? He's carrying a sheep, a little lamb. And we're like, God, I want to be that little lamb. <laughs> ah, it's like, God, God, like just, y'all like my sheep? Ah, anyway. Jesus, the shepherd, the good shepherd is carrying that little lamb, but you don't even know why he's carrying that little lamb. Here's the thing about shepherds, every time a sheep gets out of line, they will take their, 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 their staff and they will whack that sheep and break her leg. You know why Jesus is carrying that sheep? Because he, he just beat that sheep. It says, no, 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 I need to break your leg because otherwise you'll continue to run after things that are going to bring you into the wrong spaces. I need to break your leg because you're going to continue to look for love in all the wrong places. Do you feel broken right now? Do you feel like you're walking with a limp? Do you feel like, why is God doing this to me? He's not doing it to you. He's doing it for you. Yeah. Amen. And um, it's the best place we can be, in his arms. The religious leaders on Palm Sunday said, he's going to destroy our world. Yes, he is. Can I tell you who Jesus really is? Jesus is the best representation of love, of hope, of justice, of peace kindness he's better than we think we've weaponized Jesus in our politics we've weaponized Jesus with our outfits and our bumper stickers and we we nonchalantly say who Jesus is but can I tell you in this church we don't want to go out there and tell people who we think Jesus is we just want to invite people to come and make up their mind for themselves because I love what the word says come and taste and see that the Lord is good. I believe that some people say no to Jesus because they taste our lives as Christians and we taste bitter. And we taste salty. And we taste sour. But can I tell you, there's never been a woman or a man in history that have tasted Jesus and not been satisfied. It doesn't exist. But can I tell you, people have, have, have tried me and have walked away. And can I tell you, I'm done with that. I don't want people to be like me. You're not called to look like Christians. You're called to look like Christ. That's what I love about Palm Sunday. You can have thousands of people, church people, believers and unbelievers, raising up their hands and singing to a God that they don't understand. I want to invite you because you're mature enough to know that only you can decide if you accept or receive them. Let it not be the faith of your parents. Let it not just be the faith that you've always had, but... Can it be the faith that you decide here and now to say, Jesus is not who they say? Lord, I want to know who you are for myself. And can I tell you, when you invite him, he shows up. But be ready. Because when God shows up, he doesn't stay in the living room. He goes all the way into your closet. That's our fear, isn't it? That he will reject us. No, 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 no. You see, as Christians, we change our minds about God all the time, but he has never changed his mind about you. From the moment you were born until the day you die, you will be so lovable and so precious. You're everything to him. But we have to decide, is this the Jesus that we want? Or is this just something that we need right now? Let me tell you this, never make decisions based on your need. Never make a move when the bank account is low. Never make a move when the 
faith tank is low, when the love tank is low, just wait. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm not. No, 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 no. Say, okay, God, here I am. Show yourself to me. I can't, I can't show you who Jesus is. But he'll show himself to you if that's what you want. I'm going to invite you to stand to your feet with me today.